So that code ended up transitioning into tree forms. Uh, it wasn't that much of a leap. Just figure out how to, um, how to make the branches look somewhat believable. It took a lot of trial and error to get the parameters just right. And I learned a very important lesson about these recursive nested algorithms is that uh, really, really tiny changes echo down uh, from generation to generation and can have a dramatic effect. This is a failed tree. This is the tree with the wrong parameters. Uh, it made two children and then just stopped. <laughs> Poor Susian tree. But if you, you, know, you massage the parameters, get them to be a little more well-behaved, you can start to create things that look a little more realistic. Uh, and then I see actual trees, and it just, it floors me that something like that could exist because, I mean, what, you know, what are the parameters for that masterpiece? Will I ever get to a point in my work that I can create such lush uh, tree forms? Just have to wait and see. Um, a couple years ago, I was asked by the Wing Luke Asian Art Museum in Seattle to work on a piece because they had found out that I was half, uh, half Japanese and uh, they wanted to invite a bunch of half Japanese artists to do pieces in this show. And I decided that I wanted to, I wanted to uh, do a piece that uh, represented my only memory of the time that I spent in Japan. I was uh, somewhere between the ages of three and five. I lived um, in Japan, my father was in the Air Force. And I, I have this very strong memory of, of climbing Mount Fuji with my family, my, my, my parents and my brother and I, sort of wandering down this path lined with bamboo and there was you know, ground mist and it was just a fantastic time. And there was an old man in a shack and he was selling walking sticks and so my father bought a walking stick and he still has it to this day. And I was talking to my mom about this memory and she just started laughing and, uh, and told me that it never actually happened. Uh, I, had, I had fabricated most of the details based on one afternoon in a park in the middle of Tokyo. Somehow that turned into this magical journey. So the point of this piece was that um, it's a free moving camera on a, on a generative terrain, runs in real time, and at no point do you get a clear view of Mount Fuji in the distance. There's always something obscuring the view. Oh, forgot, the reason I even put this slide in this section is uh, the rule of separation came in handy here as well. I wanted to find a way to position these trees in this landscape um, and I didn't want to have to do it manually so after I created the terrain I just flooded it with a bunch of particles that had the repulsive force, let them spread out a bit and settle and where they settled is where I would plant the bamboo trees uh, because I didn't want trees to be growing into each other, I didn't want them to be too crowded. Uh, so again, a, a simple rule uh, put to use in this piece. I ended up doing another collaboration with Zoe Keating, who's a fantastic cellist who lives just north of San Francisco. And we were asked to do a piece for the San Jose Biennial last year, and uh, we decided that she would perform a 14-minute uh, cello solo while I did uh, the visuals projected behind her. And she lives amongst the redwood trees, and her album is entitled uh, Into the Trees, so she definitely wanted there to be this feeling of journey through trees. And I took that as a challenge. I, I dusted off the Fuji code, and, um, and this is what I ended up with. And so this piece ran in real time. It was made with Cinder, and I controlled it. Uh, I controlled the camera. I controlled the spawning of the elements in the scene. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to run this, see if it works. So this is the actual app, but I won't be able to turn on all the effects because it, uh, it, uh, I bought a nice, powerful PC tower uh, to, make it, to make it behave at 60 frames per second. So the, the journey begins at night. You look up and see shooting stars. I don't know how well the stars are showing up, but uh, you, you get the idea. And then slowly the sun starts to rise. Uh, there, there was this grass effect um, but I'm going to leave it off for the purpose of this demo because my laptop doesn't like it when I do that. And so as the music starts to, to build to a crescendo, I start to introduce elements into the scene uh, where these rocks, boulders will rise up out of the ground and um, these, uh, these small trees and bushes start to grow. An overzealous light bloom effect. But then at the climax of the song, 
uh, the redwoods rise up and kill my frame rate. <laughs> and there's, there's, a, there's like a, a, a ground mist toggle as well, but I'm not going to turn that on because that will bring me down to about one frame per second. But it ran beautifully on the PC. But just as an aside, I was looking back over some of the process stills that I took. I have a tendency to take lots of screen grabs of the projects that I'm working on uh, just for documentation purposes. And when I looked back over the screen grabs and compared them to the final piece, I felt I had done myself a great disservice because anything that was what I considered to be a bug, I just pushed aside and didn't revisit. Um, at one point, I left the normal map on uh, and it colored the ground plane, this, uh, this purplish green hue. And it was fantastic looking back at it, but at the time it was, oh, why is it doing that? Go back to black and white, because that's how I envisioned you to begin with. And I had another bug where the trees grew up these absurd angles forming this sort of uh, crystalline structure. I really wish I had kept something like this in the final piece because I have a much stronger emotional reaction to these stills than I do for the final piece that we performed. So uh, the lesson learned, don't, don't discount your bugs as being nuisances. Every now and then you're gonna come up with something pretty fantastic that you, that you, you know, would not have intended in the first place. So getting back to the rules, uh, the second rule is the rule of cohesion. So if you imagine the source particle again, an, any particle that enters the red zone is drawn in towards the center. As soon as it reaches the blue zone, it's repelled back out. So you end up getting this, um, this uh, clumping um, effect that's much more reminiscent of mosquitoes or moths. And it doesn't feel super organic. I did put it to some good use. Uh, it was the, it was the, uh, those two rules were the main forces that were driving the magnet magnetosphere visualization, which ended up becoming the iTunes visualizer. Uh, all of these tiny particles are experiencing this, uh, this constant tug of war with the neighbors. They, they, they want to get closer, but then at some point they're told to repel, and so there's this nice interaction between the particles. But then I tried to do a collaborative piece with, uh, with Nando Costa, who was at Nervo, and he wanted a flocking birds algorithm. And at the time, I knew, only knew of the two-rule behavior for flocking. And you know, the end results were, were a, bit, um, a bit too intense for my taste. I wanted it to be more believable. I wanted the whole thing to seem a little more realistic. But what I got was this clumping mass. It was like they were trying to you know, tear the flesh off of some poor field cow. <laughs> My brain went elsewhere there. And then you see what actually happens in nature, and it doesn't look anything like that horrible thing I just showed you. It's, um, it's, it has, uh, there's more space in between the birds. You never get the feeling that they're going to necessarily collide into each other. And uh, they, they fill the space very beautifully. And the behavior is something that was missing from the flocking simulations that I did. Uh, it, was, it was around that time that I saw a lecture by uh, someone from Princeton named Ian Cousin who works for the Collective Animal Behavior Department. And uh, he was talking about his rules for flocking. And I was surprised to see that he had the same first two rules, the separation and cohesion. But all he did was add a new zone in the middle, uh, the zone of alignment. So when a particle enters the red zone, it's drawn in towards the center. If it reaches the blue zone, it's repelled back out. But when it's in the, the green zone, which is sort of the sweet spot, it tries to move in the same direction as the other particle. And it was a very simple change. It ended up being you know, five minutes worth of coding to implement it into the piece that I had. And before where I had this sort of um, undulating clumping of particles, um, after a while, the particles begin to sort themselves out and they start to travel with their nearest neighbors and they begin to move as a group. And you know, before 400 frames had passed, they had formed into a torus all swimming around the center point. This, uh, this was not real time. This is uh, uh, high res metaballs and I believe there's even motion blur blurring as well. So this probably ran at you know, a frame every 20 seconds but it's just because metaballs are metaballs are rough <laughs>